I, I thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I really appreciate having the chance to speak to some people that I haven't seen in a really long time. Um, this is a very friendly crowd. Um, and I, I'm going to probably adjust a little bit what I was going to do because I think almost all of you have like on a tous francophone. You see, wow. Okay. Pas tous. Mais la plupart. Okay. Um, so I'll do some activities um, with the uh, actual like French manuscripts if, if we have a time as kind of a little brain break. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, kind of on two levels. Um, Really what I want everybody to get out of this talk is why, do you, why would you study manuscripts and in particular why would you want to digitize them or mark them up with a different XML kind of language around it. Um, I'm going to talk about three different areas of that. So I'll talk about genetic criticism, um, I'm going to talk about the actual Samuel Beckett project itself, and then I'm going to talk about the TEI initiative which um, encompasses a lot more than Beckett scholarships. This is the kind of an international project um, with a universal markup language to be able to digitize um, manuscripts in a very meaningful way. Um, and then I have the honor to be able to explain myself to some of my <laughs> former teachers. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but I'm going to do so in a funny way if I can. Um, so I don't, know why, um, I don't know why it was hard for me 10 years ago to talk to some of you about what I was doing while I was working in the archive. But um, I wasn't just sitting at home watching Cardinals games. <laughs> Uh, so I actually used um, a lot of the knowledge and, and just insights that I gained in working with Beckett's manuscripts to create a lot of my own writing. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of that writing and I'm also going to talk about just some of the life lessons that I learned through, uh, throughout this process and how that's influenced uh, what I'm doing today. So I've got a lot of screenshots. Um, the first one I'm going to start with is from the Samuel Beckett Digital Manuscript Project. Um, I'm almost starting at the end before going to the beginning. So why would you do this? Well, first off, most people can't read Samuel Beckett's handwriting. <laughs> right? In a second, you're going to get a chance to try to do this yourself. Um, second, it's a, it's a matter of access. right? So if this manuscript is at the Henry Ransom Center in Austin, Texas, how are we all going to have a chance to go see this? Um, and so what people are trying to do with these digital manuscript projects is cr democratize access to the materials. And then you're trying to do so in a way that makes it meaningful, right? Because if I hand you just the scanned image, many of us are just going to walk away from it, right? We don't necessarily want to spend two hours per page trying to go through, like I did in some cases with a magnifying glass, and like look and find out all these different words. It's much nicer if you can have someone who has done that work for you. And then on the research side, you might be very interested in what wasn't in the published version. What came out of it? Um, and if you look at any of Samuel Beckett's manuscripts, you're going to see a heavy editing process. And so this allows you to give that. You can click on any segment. You can see what the actual transcription and type transcription is. You could use that. You could copy and paste that text and use it to cite it if you wanted to. And then also, if you'll see this little N note, you can create critical commentary. So um, Dr. Nixon and Dr. Van Huel, that's what they've done. They've gone through and they have meticulously looked at these works and they have made connections. They've made connections to many of Samuel Beckett's letters and put the connections inside of those manuscripts. Um, and this is why we do this. This is why we would spend hours you know, messing with these texts and doing um, the kind of back behind the scenes work that we do. Um, same thing but in French. Um, I chose this one because this is a page for the Limno Nable that was completely deleted. So if you're really interested in the trilogy and you're really interested in this novel, it might be helpful to know that there were many other versions to the beginning of this text. And now what this site has been able to do is to democratize them, give, give you access to being able to do so. What they've done at the Digital Beckett Manuscript Project is pretty amazing. So they've gone through and they've tagged all kinds of different segments of the text, but then within each of those segments they've gone and almost done a line by line all the way across, sometimes up to 30 or 40 versions of the text. And then they created a tool where you can click on one line and you can compare all the versions of that line through every possible manuscript. Um, so this can become very, very powerful. 
If you are a critic that is looking at one particular line or you have a theme that you're looking for, you can go through and search and find all of the material that you need on that theme or that word. Um, I just wanted to, once again, give them a, a huge shout out. Um, they are working on the canonical text of Beckett and are little by little chipping away on every piece of material that he has ever touched. Um, so there are published um, digital uh, manuscripts of all of his most famous works already available. Um, just wanted to make you all aware of that. What do you do with this stuff? So I think the tricky part, and I'll talk about what the tricky part was for me, is is it really important to know every single version of a text? What can you do with that information? Is it important or is it something that you should separate? So in the field of genetic criticism, and I'll let you all read the quote while I kind of betemont summarize what's, what's going on. There are kind of two different approaches. Well, there are kind of two different approaches. So you can, you can look at each individual ver version and separate them and deal with the text as its own unique text. Or you can do what, what they're doing in this project is looking at the I entire composition process. Um, and so Critical insight can come in two different ways. If you want to look at it just as, all right, I want to see what draft version one of Le De Peuple is, and I want to write a critical analysis of that draft version, you can choose to do so. Or you can take a look at all of the draft versions, all of the typescripts, everything that you can come up with around this text, both in French and in English, and you can create an overall kind of critical body around the interpretation of that text. So now I'm going to get into the kind of the technical stuff. So, are there any coders in here? Anybody who, no? <sighs> Part of the reason I'm here is I'm trying to find someone to help on this. Um, and I think, I think there's a huge area of research that is, there's a huge void kind of in research right now. Because a lot of us that are in humanities are really into the humanities, right? But we don't necessarily care so much about how to make that work, right? All the different software and all the different coding and everything you need. But there's really a huge opportunity right now, right? So even if you're not into Beckett, whoever you are into, there are most likely large manuscripts available. And they are very isolated and living in different places. And some people have transcribed them and some haven't. Some people have transcribed them just for themselves. Some have published more kind of meaty tra transcriptions. What this allows you to do is insert a meta language onto the language that is already there and then create a true database. And so when I'm going to talk about XML, what I'm really talking about is just a language on top of the language that's already there. All right. I was really hoping there would be some coders. <laughs> so when most people go in and they see the manuscript, that's not what I see. What I see is kind of another language that's going to go on top of the manuscript that is going to allow me to look for certain features. So to find these features, you need to create different categories. And so there are different tags. And so for each section of a text, you're going to choose one of these seg or segment tags so that you can then create a nice kind of archived, um, uh, total like archived collection of, of, the, of the work itself. So once you create the segments, you've got to then go in and be like, all right, well, did he type it? Did he use a black pen or a blue pen? Was there a translation in there? Were there notes on the bottom? So every time I looked at a manuscript page, I had to find another kind of meta language to describe whatever that feature was that I was going to then transcribe into the text. So um, I'm just showing you two pages, but this is about a 20 page document. So all of us that have been working in the digital manuscript project, like we would send emails to each other. Hey, I've got um, a blue ink, um, little scribble at the bottom of the page, what, how should I tag it? Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a universal language and it's now, um, I'm well out of this, um, but 
just even in looking at the current language that they have, they've gotten even more and more detailed and more and more finite. And what the TEI project is trying to do is to use the same language for every manuscript and every author so that we can all be speaking that same language when we're going and trying to put them through these different types of viewing software or different types of search engines. So this leads me to um, a home page that I created in 2007 <laughs> for this institution. So as um, Ms. Allen said, I was working with Dr. Lowenstein and we were, just, we were just supposed to go into the archive and find something cool, really. Um, and so Joe Lowenstein is really, really into um, James Merrill and Edmund Spencer. And he has been working on a digital humanities library for these authors for a really long time. And he came in and he was like, hey, are you all aware that there is this thing called TEI initiative? And of course, none of us were aware of it. And so I think we were about eight. I was the only one that was like, no, like, yeah, tell me about that. Like, what, what do you mean? What is this? So he then shows me things like that. And I should have run. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I just got really interested. I don't, I, I don't know how to explain it. Um, this just logically makes sense to me. It just seems like a really, really um, meaningful way to kind of take in an archive and then also share it. Uh, so that all led to me creating this uh, website that I guess, according to Joel, still lives somewhere in the, in the WashU world um, that uh, really challenged me as a computer scientist. Um, I had made websites. Um, for uh, former teachers at, at WashU. Um, I had made, um, you know, just fun websites and blogs th and for myself, but I'd never been challenged to do anything kind of more on the academic front. And so I, I was inspired by the De Poplero, and for those of you who are aware, um, in the story, the characters are in a hellscape, pretty much. They're stuck inside of a cylinder. It's dark, it's hot, your skin is drying out. Um, very, very lovely Beckett themes, uh, like we've seen in many of his texts. And everybody is, is kind of doing something at the beginning. They're, they're climbing up ladders, or they're walking in circles, or they're, they're, they're fully into the human condition and the repetition and trying to do everything that they can. So I was like, all right, well, I need a vision. I need a, a way to visualize this. So of course, I put Samuel Beckett inside of the cylinder with this weird painon, like the painon, like the weird light um, that he talks about in the text. Um, and then created a site that um, allows you to not only just look at scanned images of the manuscripts, but then, and I'll show you the site a little later, allows you to compare like multiple draft versions of the text themselves. So I got really into Le De Papleur. I wasn't thinking that this was a text that was going to be the most important to me. Um, I was really into the trilogy. Um, I had been really, really rocked kind of emotionally after reading the trilogy. And then I ran into this text, and it's very apocalyptic and kind of dark. And I'm like, OK, am I, am I going to dive into this? And I did. And it took me to a pretty dark place. I will not lie. I spent a year and a half kind of in this weird <laughs> landscape, stuck inside this cylinder in this kind of maniacal way of drafting um, this work. In a second, I'm going to hand everybody um, a version of the text. I just want us to take. Uh, a few minutes to kind of really try to read Samuel Beckett because the one thing that I really wish I could give in this talk would for, for all of us to kind of go grab a notebook and kind of start flipping but I don't think Joel would probably like that so much. Um, so before I do that just to give you an idea um, for someone in the digital manuscript world that page looks like that. All right. I have four different versions of Le De Peuplero, so I think I'm just going to randomly hand everybody one. I'd like to take five minutes to have everybody read a little bit. Um, ideally, you're working with a partner or somebody else so that you're you know, not totally solo on this. I'm going to give you version two. All right, so I think that gives everybody kind of a feel for the, for the text. Um, I think little by little you get used to the style, you get also used to the way that he scratches out things, you get used to the way that he inserts things in the margins, um, and then I was just talking about different strategies when you're unsure. So there were software programs that you could use where if you knew three or four letters, 
and you enter a little star, you, it'll give you all the possible words in French language, um, and then you're, you know, you're deducing. You'll see that sometimes there's a little N, and um, in, in cases like that, mm -hmm. I would just be a little note like, I, I'm 50-50 on this, like this is the word that I think, like this could possibly be this word, um, and then you just note it. Um, so what we did in 2007 was um, find a way to code all of these versions and then put them into software that would allow you to compare them side by side. And so I, I reached out to these scholars in New Brunswick and they had this thing called the versioning machine and I just kind of rewrote the code a little bit so that it would work for the tags that we were using. This tool is not as good as the tool that is currently available now at the Digital Manuscripts Project, but it was, it was pretty nice then. You could highlight certain things and then look all the way across. Um, and this would give you a really, really kind of visually compelling way to look at the manuscripts. So at that time, um, as I was starting my research, I was really focused on the idea of reduction. Um, so everybody thinks of Samuel Beckett as this, you know, kind of really, really tightly wound, everything is perfectly crafted, and it is. Um, and you can see that in his writing process, but he definitely doesn't start that way. Um, he starts there with a lot of free writing in many ways, and it's a, a strong process of elimination. So as I was kind of getting further into my research here, what I was trying to figure out is, is there a way that I could tag features in his writing, like the elimination of a subject pronoun, or the elimination of articles, or an unconjugated verb versus just using an infinitive, to create kind of a searchable database to be able to look for some trends to come almost prove um, this kind of minimalistic style. And then I, 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 I quite honestly, I kind of got lazy. I was like, just visually, like, look. <laughs> like, like, do you really need to create this massive search engine when every, pretty much every time you click on a paragraph in one of his short fiction works, like, you see this chiseling away. And it occurs in English as well. So even from the French into the English, he's doing the same thing. So there's something inherent in Beckett, there's this absolute need to carve away, to trim away, and remove everything that you possibly can. And to do so in a very kind of systematic way. So for some of you that had the versions three and four, he started to create little subcategories for the paragraphs. Um, everything was well crafted, very geometric um, and mathematical. And that's where I'm still puzzled. I can't quite figure out um, the true kind of real, real reasons behind some of these strange permutations and, and um, and extractions that he has in his process. Um, so we, we created the site um, while I was teaching here. I think when I was doing 308 and 307, I would come in and have students, and I have, you know, I can share this with any of the teachers if they would like, some kind of larger group, small group activities that they can do with the manuscripts. Um, some translation ex exercises, so taking the French and seeing what their translation uh, would give in English. But let me get back to the presentation. So at the um, manuscript project, they've already started now doing some of this work. So they've, they've aggregated, um, and they've done this for all the texts that are available. How many things have been added? How many have deleted? How many were modified? And they've run these almost statistical uh, analyses for, for all the works. Um, I'm going to talk about some small features of the collection just so that I can maybe spark some interest for one or two of you to go in there and look at the notebooks. Beckett loved to cross things out, <laughs> sometimes violently. Um, I always found those to be really interesting. It was almost like finding your sister's diary for me. Um, and these were the emotional moments for me in the archive. And I'm going to talk about how this was emotional for me in many different ways. But that is when I felt the most connected to like the creator um, because he didn't want us to see this. Right? He was, he was adamant to get rid of this material. And in almost all the notebooks, they are heavily redacted. I mentioned earlier mathematics. Um, and this is where I'm still stumped to this day. He has these equations. He draws out geometric forms. Um, they're all over the notebooks. I can't quite wrap my head around them all. He's just trying to get even with all the math teachers that were there. <laughs> I hope it's that simple. Uh, I hope it's that simple. Uh, I think there is a, a, a strong sense in Samuel Beckett to um, 
to make everything perfect, to overly construct it. And I think he kind of found peace in the mathematics in that way, but I can't prove it. Um, so these are just more examples. These are all in the margins of Le De Peupler. Uh, so while I was here, I, I spent about a year and a half in the room right over there going through all the major notebooks. And in the end, I transcribed with XML coding um, Assez, Bing, d'un ouvrage abandonné, imagination morte imaginée, le dépeupleur, pas moi, not I, um, as much material as I could while I was here. Um, last but not least, I think on this, the more academic side of this, manuscript study is really fun. It's really fun because it's international as well. Um, all of these institutions are a part of this project and are housing institutions of manuscripts. I got to travel to most of them and look at manuscripts at most of them and had a lot of fun doing it.